Do you think Matthew was born before or after World War One? Not even wow. not even World War Two. World yeah. War One. What is this guy's name? <laughs> At the sincere K Bear. Just see. I don't know if you can read between the lines here, but um, <laughs> that's, that's what I'm. That's a tough I, one. That's a just so you know. I'm no. old, but I'm not that old. No. World War II so would have been the question. That would be so that ended in 1945. So it's over under 77 and a half years. Um, yeah. So, you guys are cruel. Yeah. You guys are cruel. That's cruel. what you are. Okay. Very cruel. Fantasy Football Happy Hour with Matthew Berry, served by Applebee's. It is the Fantasy Football Happy Hour with me, Matthew Berry. You are Jay Croucher. We are here. We are drinking. Do I have? A, I don't have a drink. It's this is coming. outrageous. It's coming. Bartender now, said today. I was, have I been cut off before the show? This is a new first. <laughs> yeah. This is very upsetting. All right. That's All what right. are you going to do? All right. That's fine. Mm. That's fine. This is this is why I do shots before the show, just there to make go. sure I'm good. So, so Matthew. Yes, sir. Last night we did yeah. different things. You had a fantasy draft with. Chris Paul and Jay-Z and some others while I stayed in my hotel room in Stanford and watched the film Armageddon, uh, which, you know, I like to watch every kind of 18 to 24 months to make sure I'm staying in touch with the themes, but we won't dwell on that. How was the draft? It was great. Uh, you know, listen, it was a lot of fun. It's my 10th year uh, doing that league and that draft, and it's, it's, a, it's a bunch of great guys. And so um, uh, here's the problem, is I would love to tell you, like, all the things that were said, but none of them are appropriate for television. <laughs> But we do it every year at the at the 4040 Club, the famed uh, 4040 Club in New York City, and uh, it's a great time. Uh, I think I got out of there about 2 a.m. Okay. And so, yeah, I I might still be drunk from that. That maybe that's why they didn't it's... give me a, a a drink. But anyway, it was uh, it was a great time. It was uh, a lot of fun, and um, you know, again, a lot of trash talk. It's it's very cool. You can if you uh, if you go to um, uh, Steve Stout, who's in the league, S T O U T E. If you go to his uh, Instagram story. Uh, Jesse Itzler, uh, uh, Rich Kleiman, uh, they're all in the league, and I think they've all posted stuff on their Instagrams, and I will as, as well as well if you want to see a uh, Very thing. good. This Very is the one cool thing, though, is so Jay has a, um, has a deal with Tiffany's. Okay. Yeah, right. To and be clear, so, you're not talking about Jay C. No, about no, Jay Hope. Jay Z, yeah. yeah. Reasonable and doubt. And so, yeah. um, so I believe they, they created the trophy. It's They created the <laughs> league trophy for this league. It's the greatest trophy I've ever seen in my life. Like, it is a... It is a Tiffany. Anyway, there's okay. pictures of it online. If, again, if you go to any of those Instagrams I mentioned, or I'll put on mine. Um, uh, it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. All right, yeah, let's, it's a good time. Let's it's jump a different in, world. Let's jump into the headlines from Roto World. The first right. one, big news from the past 48 hours or so. Jimmy G is staying in San Francisco. How does this change your opinion of the Niners, if at all? Uh, <clears throat> the only thing it does is maybe it gives me a little bit of a pause on Trey Sermon. Trey Sermon has massive upside. Jimmy Garoppolo does not as, yes. it come, as it relates to fantasy. What that means is, though, is unlike, say, Justin Fields or Trevor Lawrence or, you know, Jalen Hurts at the high end. Sorry, about Trey Lance. I mean, so, yeah, I'm talking about Trey Lance. Unlike for specific to Trey Lance's fantasy value, Trey Lance was a love for me this year. He's a trendy sleeper for a lot of people. What I'm saying is, is that unlike – Guys like Justin Fields, Trevor Lawrence at the high end, Jalen Hurts, people that have a lot of upside, but there are questions about, you know, are they ready to be franchise NFL quarterbacks? We're not talking about fantasy value, but franchise NFL quarterbacks. The fact is, is that those guys are going to be starters, barring injury, like they're going to be the starters all year long. Like the Bears are committed to Justin Fields, the Jags are committed to Trevor Lawrence, the Eagles are committed this year to Jalen Hurts. Those guys are going to be starters all year long, barring injury. Trey Lance... Not so much. The 49ers are like, we think we got a shot. We, okay. The 49ers are like, we got a shot at a Super Bowl. And, and so, I mean, like, you know, they went far in the playoffs last year. We are a legit Super Bowl contender this year. And if Trey Lance is not up to snuff, they know they can win with Jimmy Garoppolo. Again, not a lot of upside, but he is, he is safe. He's a solid NFL quarterback. He can manage the game well. He can run Kyle's offense. That's the thing. We just don't know on Trey Lance. Now, they've gone all in on – but by keeping Jimmy Garoppolo around and redoing the contract – it's a little way of they're saying like, hey, we've got a we've got a legit insurance policy if Trey Lance can't meet the task at hand. So that I just I as it relates to fantasy to bring it back to that, 
I would be nervous, Jay, about going into his fantasy season with Trey Lance as my only fantasy quarterback. Okay, that's interesting. I kind of go the other way where I don't think this really affects Trey Lance because I think that they're not going to bench him on performance. I just think that Kyle Shanahan is so all in on Trey Lance. If they bench him in week nine because he's playing poorly, I think he just has to work through it. If it's so bad that he has to be benched, then yes, that's a small percentage chance and that's in play. But otherwise, I think this is it's only good news for the Niners in betting markets because now they're more insulated against injury at the quarterback position than any other team in the league. So they're the fourth favorite in the mm. NFC at plus 750. Mm. You would feel better about that now than you would have a week ago when the situation was suspect. But I just I don't think they're going to bench Lance unless he's absolutely dreadful. Well, but okay, but he might be. He could be. I mean, be, you're like, but... I, like if they're... If they're three and five going into week nine, yeah, and I don't know when their bye week is off the top of my head, but like to your point, they're three and five. Can you bring him back though next year after that? I mean, you benched I, him I mean for right. GG? Like I, there, I, I am with you. It's not going to be one of those things where they're just going to be like, ah, you threw a bad pick. Yes. Come on. But the fact of the matter is, is that if they get off to a slow start or if his performance is poor, there are going to be people clamoring like, what are we doing? Yep. This guy, this guy has a very, in terms of Trey Lance, he has a very limited amount of playing time. Right? He played one game his senior year. He played two games last year. Like it's he doesn't have a long resume of experience here. And I you're asking him to lead a playoff team to the yeah. Super Bowl. I still think he will have a long leash because of how sure. early in the team is. It's just slightly less. But it's long right. Than it was and previously. you and I can dis you and I can disagree about how sh much shorter that leash just yes. got. But we both agree it definitely got shorter. It definitely got shorter. Right. Absolutely. It's, there's a non-zero chance that Trey Lance gets benched this year for performance. Yes. Whereas if their backup was Chase Daniel. You know what I mean? Like, that's not happening. I think the other thing, too, is if Lance does get injured and Jimmy G comes in and is rolling, then maybe Lance doesn't come back in as quickly. That's the other thing, too, I think. Yeah. Uh, just, but, that, that, that's, I just, if you draft Trey Lance and we still love the upside and we still think he's got the, he's got the potential, the, the range of outcomes to be a top five fantasy quarterback, I just make sure you get, get a Kirk Cousins, get a, get a solid, you know, get a Derek, Derek Carr, get somebody solid if you're waiting outside the top ten for a quarterback, get a Get a mid-tier solid guy, you know, and we, we like Carr and Cousins quite a bit For here. For sure. Okay, the other Trey in San yeah. Francisco, at least he used to be in San Francisco, Trey Sermon was waived. Does this change your opinion on Jeff Wilson, on Elijah Mitchell, on any of the San Francisco running backs? No. No, okay. No, I mean, like... <laughs> Do you want to move on? <laughs> yeah, the fantasy impact is nil. Like, yeah. hey, you know how you were ignoring Trey, uh, Trey Sermon in your fantasy drafts? Now you can continue to ignore Trey Sermon in your fantasy drafts. The, the only adjustment you need to make is on your cheat sheet, it probably says Trey Sermon San Francisco. And now if you just cross out the SF and put yeah, UFA, yeah, yeah just instead of okay. UFA, you know, unrestricted free agent, like, you know, or just FA free agent, like, because he's, he's just available, that's what you can do. Like, the, if you are drafting Elijah Mitchell, the insurance running back you want is Jeff Wilson Jr. Yes. I feel very strongly about that. Sure. And I do think that Wilson will have a role because they like to use multiple running backs. Uh, I think Mitchell gets 70% of the running back carries at, in, in full health. But Wilson's going to have a role, uh, and they like him there. He needs to stay healthy himself as well. But no, you know, it's just whatever. Trey Sermon went high in dynasty drafts, and that, that does not look good right now. Yeah, I think the, thing, the takeaway there is that Jeff Wilson is now one injury away instead of one and a half or two injuries away from real relevance. But, you know, still. I, I think he inspiring. was. I mean, I don't think Trey Sermon was. I mean, I know they were like, they were trying to like justify the draft mm. pick because he went, you know, he went third in the third round or whatever. But like, I don't think he was ever close to being Elijah. When they waived the, I mean, they used a third round draft pick on him, and it's his it's his second year in the NFL. It's not great. And yeah, and then they're like, we're good. Yeah, we're good. See ya. We're good. Not ideal. Okay, next one. Yes. JK, Hashtag not ideal. J.K. Dobbins. His status for Week One is certainly in doubt, and the Ravens also signed Kenyon Drake, who we spent forty five minutes on in last week's show. Right. How does this change your opinion of, of J.K. Dobbins and his season outlook? Because we were pretty bullish about him last week, and then only bad things have happened since. So um, I think uh, so. I'm in. I'm in on J.K. Dobbins because I think, to your point about what you're saying, like with the betting markets with uh, with the Niners, I think this is going to just lower his ADP, which is already pretty low. He's he's uh, he's currently going 54th overall on Yahoo. 
I think the last time I saw it was uh, like running back 24. And this, this will drop him even more as we get into, you know, this is a big draft weekend. A and so maybe he's not ready for week one. Maybe he's not ready for week two. But he's going to be ready. He's, you know, the fact that he's out there, the fact that they're not putting him as of right now on the physically enabled reform list means they expect him to be active at some point in the first four games. I, like at, at full health, and he needs to get there, but at full health, Kenyon Drake can't hold a candle to J.K. Dobbins. No. Right? And so I, I'm – or Mike Davis. Neither of them can. So I, I, I actually think that, again, I wouldn't want J.K. Dobbins to be one of my two starting running backs. But, again, in the first couple of weeks with every team uh, playing and there's no, no, no bye weeks yet, I think you can fill in. And I do think Dobbins has a big second half of the season, big three-quarters of the way for the season. You know, this is a guy, if you think about the final six games of his 2020 – Rushing touchdown in all six games, had seven total. He averaged over 17 fantasy points per game. He was a top 11 fantasy running back in points per game. Like, that's the, that's the upside there. And he was only in that – he did that all in, like, 13 touches a game. We get him up to 16 touches a game, 17, which I think he could do, especially with Edwards coming back slowly. And, you know, Drake and Davis are more depth, I think, than real threats to his playing time. Yes. I actually think this news is, as it relates to his fantasy value – Hurts, obviously, in the very short term, but long term this year, I'm in on J.K. Dobbins. Something interesting to note here is that one of the preseason storylines around the Ravens, Jay, is like, well, last year when they were top nine in the NFL in pass attempts, yeah. that was because they lost Dobbins, they lost Edwards, they were, you know, they had Grand street free agents, right. Well, now still, you know, <laughs> same, once again, no names. Gus at, in there, like, oh, they're going to go back to run heavy this year. And I'm like, are we sure they're going to do that? Because, again, right, Dobbins a little bit gimpy, Edwards is out. Drake and Davis are both nice pass catching running backs. Like my, my Lamar concern. Jackson's playing for a quarter, you know, playing yeah. for a contract. He just saw he just saw Russell Wilson get a quarter of a billion dollars yes. or whatever it was. Like, you know, Lamar, you don't you don't make a quarter of a billion dollars by handing off. You understand what I'm talking about, Jay? No. And they have more receiving weapons, I th we think, than maybe the general public thinks, in that you have Mark Andrews, we love Rashad Bateman. Isaiah Likely, as well, is a great receiving target for a rookie. I'd just yeah. be concerned with Dobbins that there's just a lot of people there now in Baltimore who want to play in Drake Edwards when he comes back, and Mike Davis, and Dobbins coming off the injury. I think yeah. that latter half of the season is when he could really ignite, but I think it's going to be a bit messy until then. Now, but that'll, that'll depress his ADP. Again, I, I, we agree here. I think it'll be sooner than the second half of the year. I think it'll be, you know, a couple of games in. But, look, I mean, just because they want to play, meaning Drake and Davis want to play, doesn't mean they're going to get to play. Yes, absolutely. J.K. Dobbins, from a – forget fantasy, whatever. J.K. Dobbins, just from the film, J.K. Dobbins is the most talented running back on that team, and I don't think it's all that close. It's not close, no. Okay, another high draft pick who's fallen on some more difficult times than J.K. Dobbins. Now, this is funny because the initial draft of the rundown... Wait, what, what part is funny? That this guy has fallen on hard times? <laughs> you are dark. <laughs> no. Look at these. What? These Australians are dark. <laughs> They're so mean. What is funny is that in, in the initial draft of the rundown, yes. it said the Vikings snag Jalen Ragor from Philadelphia. And that language has been changed to the Vikings acquire Jalen Ragor from Philadelphia, which I think is apt yeah. because a little less positive. I don't think Jalen Ragor yeah. is going to have too much of a role, even with the, the passing offense. Yeah. Vikings, Vikings shrug their shoulders <laughs> yes. and say, yes. sure, why not yes. Yes. to Jalen Ragor? Yes. Acquire is the perfect term. Right. Uh, I think that he's tolerate. Still, tolerate. Yeah. Tolerate him on the premises. Yeah. I still think exactly. he's worse than KJ Osborne. He's clearly worse than Justin Jefferson, Adam Thielen, Herb Smith as well will get more targets. Even with the Vikings playing 11 personnel and bringing their offense into the 21st century, I don't think there's going to be much room for Jalen Ragor, the great Jalen Ragor, unless we're seeing multiple injuries. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting. It's one of those things to just sort of keep on your radar. I agree with you. I think you're drafting uh, for the, 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 wide, the pass catchers. You were drafting Justin Jefferson, Adam Thielen, KJ Osborne, Irv Smith in that order, is what I would do. Okay. You could swap Smith and Osborne if you were if you needed a tight end as you're going through your draft. But the four guys that you see on your screen there, Jefferson Thielen, Irv Smith Jr., and uh, KJ Osborne, those are the guys you want. Having said that, like Jalen Rager was a first round pick, so right? It's, I know. And it, it's like so. it's not his fault. That he was drafted one spot ahead of Justin Jefferson, right? I mean, like, I, I, like. Now you get the dream now, Hang on, pair him up. Jalen, Jalen Rager had a very productive college career. No one was just like, "Wow, what are you doing drafting Jalen Rager?" Like yeah. he was expected to go in the first two rounds, you know, the NFL draft the year he came out. 
And that's a team that has had inconsistent quarterback play, inconsistent coaching, a lot of turmoil in the front office. It is a tough place to play in Philadelphia if you don't produce right away. I don't know. I've never met Jalen Rager. I've never talked to him. I don't know his mental. All I'm saying is, is that, like, he's not some – he, while his NFL career has not gone the way that he or the Eagles hoped it would go the first two years, I, fresh start, new division, new coach, less expectations. They traded a conditional fourth and a seventh for him. I wouldn't be surprised. I'm not, I'm, you're definitely not drafting him. I'm just saying I wouldn't be surprised if Rager makes a waiver wire column at some point this week, okay. at some point this year, mm-hmm. where you're just like, oh, you know what, actually, you know, he's been kind of productive the last couple of weeks. Anyway, that's okay. we should bookmark this because Matthew Perry is all in on Jalen Rago. I'm let's, uh, let's, him. let's play I'm this like, back in, yeah. uh, in week 12 I'm, when he's, I'm nearly, uh, when he's playing Maybe for I'm, the Raiders. Listen, just because I'm not some Australian asshole like dumping <laughs> on this poor kid, you know, like the I fact like the that talent. That, like, you, you don't, you don't, you hate this guy. You hate this guy with a fiery passion. You hate this guy the way you hate, you know, people that don't like Armageddon or Keanu Reeves. Like he's the anti Keanu Reeves for you. Like I'm just that's telling you, um, yeah, I mean, like. I, I don't know. I, I just like a, a somebody that was a first round pick in the NFL that is now going to a, pa- a good quarterback and a pass happy offense, you know, that has when you think about Adam Thielen and his injury history, I don't know. I'm not ready to immediately say like there's no way this guy ever has fantasy value again. Yeah, for I'm sure. Not, and that's all I'm saying. It's not like, say, Nikhil Harry, who had Tom Brady. Uh, so there is a bit more, you know, the unknown and the bad quarterback situations relatively That's in right. terms of passing does create a little bit of upside variance, and he's going to be in a position to succeed because we think that this offense in Minnesota is yeah. going to be You're not drafting good. him, but just a name to keep, you know, you're like, hey, where'd Jalen Rager go? Yeah. Oh, turns out he's in Minnesota. Yeah. Okay, next All one. Right. The, the Chargers sign Sony Michel, formerly very briefly of the Dolphins. Now, Sean, Sony Michel's been ruining fantasy situations for half a decade okay, now. Does yeah. this change any of your opinions about Sony Michel or the Chargers? I don't think he's going to be really hurting Austin Eckler too much, but no, I Isaiah don't. Spiller? Uh, yeah, I mean, right, yeah, right, exactly. Like, just if something were to happen to Eckler, is he in the mix now, along with Spiller and Larry Roundtree and Josh Kelly and, you know, some of those guys? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. When you can't make the Dolphins, That's I know the those. Concern. I mean, they, I mean, like they've got. Listen, they have Edmonds and Mostert. Yep. They still have Miles Gaston and Savan Ahmed that they had there. But like, Tony Michelle is somebody that the Rams traded for, and the Rams were willing to let him go, and then he gets to Miami, and then Miami's like, we're okay. And so, look, any running back has value if he's going to get touches there. But I think that if anything were to happen to Eckler this year, you would see a running back by committee behind him, and. I don't know that you would have a, uh, you know, Justin Jackson situation like from, you know, the other year where it was like, you know, that one week where it was, you know, Jackson mm. just had a monster game. So I mean, McVay but, was giving carries to Cam Akers getting 2.6 yards per carry in the playoffs over Sony know, Michelle. what Sony Michelle was giving. Yeah, them. it's a weird one. It's yeah. definitely it's definitely a weird one. I, yeah, but I don't think this... Listen, if you're sitting there and trying to decide between whatever Tyler Algier and Isaiah Spiller for your last running back spot, then okay, then maybe you go with Algier, you know, yep. because Spiller's path to significant playing time just got a little bit more complicated. But that's pretty much it. Like you're talking like deep backup running back. For sure. Know. Okay, yeah. last one. Cliff Kingsbury said Zach Ertz will be close for week one with a calf injury. Now you love Zach Ertz. I do. You still love Zach Ertz. I do. Okay. All right. Okay, so, you know, maybe he doesn't play week one. Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. But this is a guy who, last year, last year, third most targets among tight ends, tied for most red zone targets among tight ends, tied for the highest red zone target share among tight ends. After he was traded to Arizona last year, he was the fifth best uh, tight end on a points-per-game basis, fourth best overall among tight ends, and he hadn't even learned the playbook. They're like, hey, Zach, run a seam route. We'll figure it out. You know what I mean? Like, he was just trying to find the field at that point. Hey, which way is the locker room? Right, and Zach Ertz still produced in a massive way, got seven and a half targets a game, tied for third most red zone targets among tight ends from the time he went to Arizona until the end. Like, yeah, give me Zach Ertz, who especially, by the way, is going 10th among uh, tight ends on Yahoo, and maybe this news dumps him a little bit in the next two weekends. I'm in on Zach Ertz. Okay. I don't know that I want him in a dynasty league, but yeah, this Could've year, a- given his ADP and that offense, like, again, invest in good offenses, invest in good quarterbacks. They have shown a willingness to throw to the tight end over the last couple of years. Yeah, I think there's a bit of a 
kind of Ezekiel Elliott vibe about Zach Ertz, but on a lower scale, where yeah. Zach Ertz has just become boring. Everyone has had Zach Ertz on their fantasy team yeah, no one likes over the past few years, but the guy He's just snoozy. produces. Yeah, even if everyone will be taking Dallas Goddard over Zach Ertz because Dallas Goddard is more fun, it's a bit more unknown, haven't seen it before, maybe haven't had him on your team. He's younger. Give me Zach Ertz. Oh, I, I'll say I prefer Zach Ertz to Dallas Goddard straight up this year. I will say that right here, right now. Hmm. And you don't even have to do that straight up because, again, on Yahoo and I assume most other platforms, he's going two or three rounds after Goddard. He's certainly going two or three tight ends after Goddard. Goddard is generally the seventh or eighth tight end off the board, and Ertz is usually in the you know, 10, 11 range among yep. tight ends. For sure. Okay, we are going to go to break. We're going to have okay. Jason Garrett coming in Hey soon. now. But Jason first. Garrett's gonna. Can we get get Jason Garrett a drink? <laughs> At yeah. least if, I know the host of the show can't get a drink. We're gonna do the IFC North first, and then I just Jason got a call Garrett from Applebee's. In. By the way, this is not a reflection on Applebee's service. Applebee's service is terrific. It's the best. It, it's it is a reflection on Brian Rubin, our producer. Yes. Specifically, Brian Rubin. He's not the best. No. Doesn't hold a candle to Applebee's. Hundred percent. Find him on social media and please yell at him. What do you know? You got a draft this weekend? I bet you do. Well, prep for your draft with the latest player rankings, projections, and more. I think the and more is key. In the NBC Sports Edge Fantasy Football Draft Guide, it is powered by Roto World, so you know it's good. Roto World, of course, the premier source of player news and fantasy information. Take advantage of our preseason special. You can get the draft guide for just five bucks. Five bucks! Come on, you can afford five bucks. You get that $5 price when you use the promo code Draft Guide at checkout on NBCSportsEdge.com slash draft guide. All right. Okay, well, there's the cut in. Divisional burning questions. Yes, divisional burning questions. Today we're going to talk about the I got AFC my drink. North. I yelled. Yeah. I yelled. I fired two people in the, in the break, but I got my drink. And now it's here. Now, I think the AFC North is the second best division in football after the AFC West. I mean, you could make a case okay. for the NFC West as well. NFC East, yeah. NFC East with sure. your Washington Commanders yeah, with the great course. Carson yeah. Wentz Hail and Logan Commander. Thomas. Yeah, of course. Yeah, hail victory. Yeah. So we're going to start with the Ravens, sure. who are the clear favorite in the division, yeah. uh, particularly post the Sean Watson suspension. The question is, what is the ceiling for Rashad Bateman this season? He's a guy that you've staked your good name to. Huh. What's his ceiling? Uh, I think his, I think his ceiling is, you know, top twenty wide receiver, sure. top fifty. I mean, like, look, it'll come down to touchdowns, right? And uh, at the moment, we expect a lot of those to go to Mark Andrews and some to Isaiah Likely. But if Rashad Bateman suddenly gets a ton of a touchdowns, like, he's got that ability. I mean, so we expect a massive target share. Okay, twenty six percent target share from Marquise Brown last year, one hundred and forty five targets, out the door now in Arizona. So that's available. And the fact that they didn't do the biggest move they made in free agency or the draft in terms of wide receiver was Demarcus Robinson. Yes. Rashad Bateman's the future. Now again, they're going to run a lot. They're going to run a lot of twelve, and they're going to play two tight ends. And so, which is why we like likely we like Isaiah Likely as the third third option in that passing game. But as we talked about in segment one, Jay, like we think there's a chance they start throwing a lot more, especially with given the the injury status of. J.K. Dobbins and Gus Edwards and Kenyon Drake just got there. Mike Davis, nice pass catcher. Like, I don't think they're going – they're going to definitely be run heavier than they were last year, but I don't think they're going to be super run heavy the way some people think, at least not at the beginning of the season. So – Lamar Jackson was on pace for almost 4,500 passing yards last season. Yes. And to go with – around a thousand rushing yards but there is the ceiling on Rashad Bateman is that he could be well he, he likely will be the most targeted wide receiver on an elite offense Correct. on a division favorite that could easily get the one seed that's going to have lots of opportunities to score and it could be more pass heavy than we expect with a, with a quarterback by the way who again like gets, who's playing for a contract again like and also I, gets better as a pocket passer every does. season the, I like again NFL teams, it's not just statistical pieces of meat. They are people like you and I, and they all have egos and, yes. and ambitions and, you know, and desires the way everyone does. And I've never met – I've met Lamar Jackson once in my life. I interviewed him when he was a rookie. So I, I, I'm just speaking from afar here. But my belief is, is that he sits here and sees the deal that a guy in his own division, the deal that Deshaun Watson got, who yeah. hasn't, you know, even with the off-the-field stuff – you know, hasn't played football Wasn't in almost a two years. MVP. Right. Yeah. 
Lamar Jackson was a unanimous MVP, and he sees Russell Wilson over the age of 30 get a quarter of a billion dollars too. And Lamar Jackson's like, where's mine? Yep. And so he's a he's a free agent at the end of the season. I mean, I think they can franchise tag him, but what a, he wants to get paid. He wants to be the highest paid quarterback in the NFL, and you're not getting paid if all you're doing is handing off. And so I, you know, Lamar, who has obviously the ability to check out of any play, like I just think they're going to be more pass heavy. I think Lamar's going to have a monster year. I know he was your ride or die choice yeah, this all year. In all in on Lamar. Let's go Lamar. Um, so yes, I mean I, I love Rashad Bateman made the love list. I'm in on Lamar. I currently have him uh, at wide receiver 31, 70th overall. He's going 82nd overall on Yahoo. So I'm a round higher on him than consensus. In the betting market, he's set at 850 and a half yards, five and a half touchdowns. So a similar season to what. AJ Brown, Devonta Smith, ironically teammates now, but to what they did last year. Yep. And that's kind of the average outcome that we're projecting. So he has upside to go 1,000 yards, seven, eight, nine touchdowns. So I think there's a Easy. huge ceiling on Rashad Bateman, and he has the talent as well. Yeah. I mean, that's the ceiling on him. I think, I think somewhere in the 20 to 30 range is where he sure. probably nets out. I'm at wide receiver 31, but again, higher than consensus, higher than uh, where he's going on Yahoo. So. Yeah. so now the next question is on the Cincinnati Bengals and on the quarterback who I think that most people would say is the best quarterback in the division over the unanimous MVP of 2019. And that's Joe Burrow. Now, do you think Joe, Bur Joe Burrow is being overdrafted? I do. I mean, Look, he, he's my QB 10. He's currently going as QB 5 on Yahoo, right? I am at 87th overall. Yahoo has him at 63rd overall. So, obviously, look, he made my hate list. And it's not that I think he's a, he's not that I think he's a bad quarterback. I think he is a, uh, I think he's a very good NFL quarterback. I think he'll be a good fantasy quarterback. I don't think he'll be a top five fantasy quarterback. As you see my quarterback rankings on the screen here, Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, Justin Herbert, Jalen Hurts at four, Lamar Jackson at five. Brady comes in at six, Kyler's at seven, Dak Prescott at eight, Russell Wilson at nine, and then Joe Burrow comes in at 10. Those are my quarterback rankings. Here's my concern on Joe Burrow. And some of these things I wrote about in my Love Hate, which is available for free on uh, rotorworld.com, NBCSportsEdge.com. I'm a company man. Three of his games last year, week 16 against Baltimore, week 17 against Kansas City, and then the earlier game at Baltimore, week yes. 7. So two games against the Ravens and that crazy week 17 game against the Chiefs. Those three games combined for 32% of Joe Burrow's fantasy points last year. Those three games. What happened with Joe and, – and so last year, prior to those last two games, those that, that week 16, week 17 game, he had like – he had six straight games of like less than two touchdown passes. Like – there, I'm worried about the inconsistency with him. And I'm worried that what he, he had such a magical year last year. Can he repeat it? Get this. Last year, Joe Burrow had a 70% completion rate. He had over 500 pass attempts, and he had at least eight air yards per attempt. Just, that's a lot of numbers that I just threw at you, but just on, break it down. In Good essence, he threw, a, he threw a ton, he threw a ton deep, and he completed an insanely high amount of passes. Since the year 2000, the only other quarterbacks that have done that, over 70% completion rate, over 500 pass attempts, at least eight air yards per target, Deshaun Watson and Drew Brees. And neither, of them, and neither of them uh, repeated. They, each of those guys did it once since the year 2000. So now you're like, well, Drew Brees is super highly efficient, right? But like he started dinking and dunking. It was like Michael Thomas and Alvin Kamara, and you know, just really close to the line of scrimmage stuff. Joe Burrow's got Jamar Chase. Yeah. He got T. Higgins. Yeah. Got Tyler Boyd is a nice player. Like, I, I don't know. I just is he gonna have a good year? Yes. Is he gonna have a top five fantasy quarterback year? Especially when you consider he doesn't run the way that Lamar or Kyler or the guys going after or Jalen Hurts, guys that are going after him do. I I do not understand Joe Burrow going top five among quarterbacks on Yahoo. That yeah. makes no sense to me at all. And I like Joe Burrow. Yeah, from a betting perspective. The Bengals and Burrow, they're a difficult team to figure out because there are so many push and pull factors where, you know, last season they had an incredibly easy schedule of defense. He had almost 1,000 yards just in those two games against mm -hmm. the Ravens who had a really bad secondary and a, so a not an NFL secondary by that Week 17 game. Now they have the second hardest schedule of defenses in the entire league. So that hurts. Also... They're not going to be, he's not going to complete as many 80 yard bombs to Jamar Chase again. No. It's just not going to happen. There's not going to be another 266 yard, three touchdown game against the Chiefs for Jamar Chase, most likely. On the other side, 
He wasn't fully healthy the first half of last season in particular. He had to go into the season, and then it was only in the second half in the playoffs where they really gave him the keys and the chef's hat and kind of just let Joe cook. So is there going to be more of that? They have a better offensive line. Jamal Chase is in his second year. Theoretically, he should be better, which seems difficult to process because he was so good last season. But just like Justin Jefferson, we didn't expect that leap last year either, necessarily. Jamar Chase might have another gear. He might be the best wide receiver in the league. And it's not out of the realm of possibility that Joe Burrow is just, not fantasy-wise, but football-wise, is just the best quarterback in the league. That's in play. It's not likely, but it's in play. So there's a lot of push and pull with the Bengals. And I think where you end yeah. up is, I might have him slightly higher than you, but not that much higher. And I definitely have him... Uh, after Jalen Hurts and those type of guys. Yeah, I just again NFL quarterback skill set, NFL quarterback skill set and fantasy quarterback skill set are two different things. Yes. Joe is a fran- Joe is no question a franchise quarterback, a guy you can build around, and he has that he has that it factor. He is that you know, guys, you know, we're we're down six. There's a minute forty five left to go. We got no timeouts. We're on our own ten yard line. I don't care. Let's go. Yes. I'm putting you on my back, and we're getting yes. we're driving down the field, and we're scoring a touchdown. We're winning this game. He's got that. I get that. Asked and answered. I just I don't know, man. Like uh, with that better offensive line, do they go more balanced? Do they run more? We expect a big year from Joe Mixon with a better defense. Do they get into shootouts here? Every defensive coordinator that has the Bengals on their team that on their schedule this year spent the offseason going like, all right, how do we slow down Jamar Chase? Last year, they didn't know how he was going to be used. He'd been out of football for a year, you know, hadn't played the year before at, at LSU. And so I think, he, you know, he, he caught a lot of defensive coordinators by surprise. There's only so much you can do in season during the week. But trust me, every defensive coordinator this offseason is just like, oh, we got Jamar Chase week, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, like yes. they're figuring it out. I still have Jamar Chase at wide receiver three. Yeah. He's awesome. He's going to have a monster year. Yeah. I just, I am, I am concerned uh, at quarterback five, you are baking in every potential piece of profit there. There's, they, you have very little room to, to earn anything and lots of chances to go down. Yeah. He needs to have a Brady or Rodgers like season from last year to earn quarterback five if he's going ahead of he's going ahead of guys like, you know, Kyler and Lamar yeah. and you we've, know, I mean, we've got his over under set in the range of forty five hundred yards, thirty four TDs. And you know who are two guys who could easily To put be up clear, those by the way, Lamar I just want to clean this up. Lamar Jackson is going ahead of him on Yahoo. Lamar's going four, Burrow's going five, but he's going ahead of Kyler Murray, going ahead of Jalen Hurts, going ahead of Tom Brady. I mean I'd rather have Tom Brady. Right. I'd also, relative to ADP, you know, those over-unders, 4,500 yards, 34 touchdowns. I think Derek Carr and Kirk Cousins could put up those type of numbers, Easy. and they're going outside the top 10. Yes. Okay, Cleveland Browns. Now, this is somewhat of a I rhetorical mean, question. Sta- Stafford, too, by the way. Definitely. I mean, Stafford, Stafford. Stafford and Rodgers are both going way, way later, going five or six rounds later than Burrow. And I, I don't think Joe Burrow, fantasy-wise, is five or six rounds better no. than Aaron Rodgers or Matthew Stafford or, you know, and he's definitely, I don't think he's seven or eight rounds better than Derek Carr or no. Kirk Cousins, which is what he's doing on Yahoo right Absolutely. now. Absolutely. Okay, next question's a little bit of a rhetorical question. Okay. What are your expectations for the Browns' offense under Jacoby Brissett? I would guess that they are low. Yeah, I mean, my expectations for the Browns' offense under Jacoby Brissett are, are um, well, they'll have an offense. Yes, yes, right. there you will know, be an like offense. Like, right, you know, yeah. b- the ball will get snapped yes. and Jacoby Brissett will hold There'll it. There'll be men on the field. Yes, there'll be men on the field. Like, they'll, they'll play the sport they'll of football. They'll play the, the, the football. Yeah, it will be recognizable to fans. Things will happen. Things will happen. <laughs> what I would say, um, I don't have high expectations. I, I think that they are going to, like, first off, outdoor, outdoor stadium, like, the way they're built and the way Stefanski runs his offense, just in general, we expect – slow pace of play they're going to run the ball a lot you know they're going to try to play good defense they're going to try to grind it out that was with baker mayfield right and now now they're you know now they got jacoby Brissett, like who is a downgrade from baker mayfield yep. so i i think it is i think it will be a again a slow paced run heavy offense i think they'll target the tight end a decent amount i think they'll probably try to take some deep shots too um, and set up play action, try to take some deep shots to Amari Cooper and Donovan, People, Donovan Peoples-Jones. And, you know, I kind, of, I kind of like Anthony Schwartz from a dynasty perspective. But ultimately, I, I don't think this is an exciting offense. I think for Nick Chubb to return his current value, he's currently going uh, as running back nine on Yahoo. Too high. 
15th overall. I'm at running back 16, 28th yeah. overall. I, I mean, this is a guy who doesn't catch passes, who is very, who is, who is volume and touchdown dependent. And I believe that because of Brissett under center, they're not going to have as many first downs. Their drives won't sustain as long. And you're going you're gonna to want to run the ball a lot to protect against Brissett. So you're going to see not just Nick Chubb, but you're going to see Kareem Hunt and Dearness Johnson. And Nick Chubb is obviously going to get his. He's going to get – but, like, if he doesn't get to 12 touchdowns, you know, um, I don't know how he gets to that number. Uh, you know, I mean – and he may need more than that. Right? Yeah. I mean, like, look I- – the betting market is projecting Cleveland, as you would expect, as a bottom 10 offense in the yeah, same sure. range as Carolina, Jacksonville, kind of like both of those offenses more than Cleveland right now. Okay, another team. He's, with a... he's just, for where he's going in Nick Chubb, I'll just say this last thing real quickly. He had six games last year where he had under 10 fantasy points. He's just, I think, from a skill set standpoint, Nick Chubb's one of the best actual running backs in the NFL. Like, he's a phenomenal running back, but he just, he doesn't catch passes in that offense, no. and he's... He's too touchdown dependent to be going ninth among offense, running backs yeah. in a bad offense. Like again, he is when he doesn't score touchdowns, like it it's not always pretty. And for a guy that you're using your first round pick on, it gets a little dicey. It's gonna for be me. a lot of Jacoby Brissett throwing incomplete yeah. on third and seven. Yes. Now the Steelers, another team that's gonna be throwing I incomplete. I do like Njoku. I do seven. like Njoku late. Okay. That's the only Cleveland offensive player that He's I sort of like. Ends. He's on your list. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in terms of ADP, in terms of where are those all the Browns players are going according to ADP, and Joku's actually the only player that I'd be like, all right. Yeah. I don't mind Kareem Hunt either, but um, yeah, yeah, not I so like much. It. Okay. Any concern? Najee Harris is too volume dependent. I'm concerned. He's he uh, a little bit. I'm actually more concerned about his passing game usage. Okay. So I mean, last year, 74 receptions. 467 yards, three touchdowns. He was the seventh best running back on a points per game basis. That was last year. All right. So, you know, you look at this in terms of last year, running backs with over 200 touches. Now, Najee Harris ranked 21st out of 26 running backs in yards per rush of qualified running backs. 21 out of 26. Yeah. 3.9 yards per carry, right? Uh, three yards per rush, I should say. Among running backs with 200 more touches, Najee Harris with 22nd out of 26 in yards per reception. So again, he was last year. He was he was driven by insane volume, right? I mean, he he had over uh, almost 400 touches last year. So just insane volume uh, and huge passing game usage. Again, 74 receptions. And as we've talked about many times on the show, Jay, I don't think. Uh, Mitch Trubisky is going to dump off nearly no. as much as Big Ben. No. Trubisky is an upgrade. Yeah. Kenny Pickett is an upgrade from Big Ben last year, who last year had to dump off a lot because he just he couldn't throw deep and he's so immobile. Yeah. Trubisky is more likely to, you know, and even Pickett a little bit, you know, if, if, if the coverage breaks down to run a little bit more as opposed to dumping it off. Harris still going to be involved in the passing game, but, like, I think 40 receptions, 50 receptions is much closer than the 74 he's going to get. So he was volume and passing game usage dependent last year. And I'm nervous that he doesn't get, he's still going to get a lot of work, make no mistake. And we think this offense will be better than it was last year. But given the fact that, you know, we're excited about Chase Claypool out of the slot, we're excited out of, we're excited about George Pickens, second year of Friermuth. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm a little nervous at his ADP at current, He's going as running back six, ninth overall. I'm at running back seven, slightly lower, but 12th overall. So I, I just, I think he's more of a top of the second round guy than middle of the first. With that offensive line and that context with the quarterback and I, maybe the upgraded receiver room, don't think there's any path to efficiency for Najee Harris, but the volume is what you want and what you like. Okay, we are going to break. When we come back, Jason Garrett will be at the table. We're going to do the Collins West Welcome slide. him to the, uh, welcome him to the happy hour. Yes. Let's get him a drink. Yep. Yeah, I was reminded of the magnitude in 2006 when my old teammate and good friend Troy Aikman gets inducted. I'm coaching the quarterbacks in Miami for Coach Saban. And finally I said, hey, my good buddy Troy Aikman is going into the Hall of Fame. It's in the middle of training camp, and he cuts me off. He says, do you know anything about life? I kind of said, well, he said, this is the Hall of Fame. 
This is a great buddy of yours, your teammates for eight years. You got to be there. Go. And he said, oh, by the way, we, we can survive without you for a couple days in Miami. <clears throat> so the complete opposite of that, 180 degrees yeah. from going to see your, your teammate and good friend getting inducted to the Hall of Fame, you have contractually obligated <laughs> have to appear on the Fantasy Football Happy Hour. Coach Garrett, an honor to have you here. What thank you, you so much. Uh, this is a choice I'm making. Stop you kidding me? You're a legend. It. Stop <laughs> it. Thank you very much. I, well, I just, because I, you do it all the time, so Jay and I, we just, I just want to applaud you. I just want to give you some oh. applause. Thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate Great you to be being here. here, Coach. Uh, listen, Coach, you just, uh, since that since that clip where we were out at, uh, in Canton at the Hall of Fame game, you've done your own personal tour of a bunch of training camps. What what, what teams have you seen? Where, where else have you gone? Well, that game was Thursday night. Yep. Friday morning, I was at Chicago's practice. Matt okay. Eberflus, the former coach of ours, is the head coach there in Chicago. And then I jumped in with Peter King, and we drove six hours and ten minutes to Minnesota. Yeah. Longer than I thought it was yeah, going to yeah. be. But spent a day with the Vikings, then I went to Green Bay and spent a day with them. And then I was just out on the West Coast with the Chargers and the Rams. And I went down to Houston to see the 49ers and the Texans play. So, saw a few teams. Yeah, they've been uh, keeping me busy. Yeah, and, and it's been fun to see these different teams kind of behind the scenes. Got great access, sitting in meetings, that kind of stuff. Really a good experience. I bet that would be really cool for you. I just, we have questions we want to ask you, but I would just think for you, because you've always been focused on your own team. Like, this is an experience that you haven't gotten to do where you get to see how other coaches are running their, their and get a, get a view that you don't normally get. Yeah, it was a fantastic experience, and you said it. You talk to other coaches about what you're doing, how you practice, how you meet, but now you're sitting in the meeting. You're on the practice field. You're actually seeing it. And to see those guys have so much respect for so many of those coaches and so many of those players at those different stops, so a, a fantastic experience for me. Yeah. Coach, one of the teams you mentioned that you went to see was Minnesota. We've been talking a lot about Minnesota and their players. He loves the Vikings. I, I do. Tell me, Vikings. tell me I'm crazy or tell me you, you like it, but I think uh, my personal take has been that the Vikings offense under Kevin O'Connell uh, and Wes Phillips – I think that offense explodes this year. What did you see in camp? Am I crazy? Am I on the right track here? Tell me what you expected of the Vikings offense from what you saw. Well, I'm pulling for the Vikings offense. Wes Phillips was my right-hand man in yeah. Dallas for a number of years, and I love him. So great that he has that opportunity to be working with Kevin on that offense. And I think we'll see a lot of what we've seen with the Rams. It probably goes back to the Redskins under Coach Shanahan. A yep. lot of the Sean McVay stuff kind of started there. And, and I think we'll see a lot of that. Uh, Kirk Cousins has been a guy who's been very, very productive. The receiver, Jefferson, is fantastic. The running back, Cook, is off the charts. So, like with most teams in the league, it's going to start up front. If they can control the line of scrimmage, let those skill guys go to work. Uh, they got a special group up there, and I think they're going to fit well into that scheme. Yeah. You mentioned Jefferson, who his first two seasons in the league, basically unprecedented in terms of what he's done at the wide receiver position. The expectation, I think, in the fantasy community, among all football fans, is that he might be the best receiver in the game by the end of this year. Are you on board with that? Do you think he has that ceiling right now? Well, best is hard. Yeah. You know, that's a high standard. There's a lot of other good ones, but he's certainly among the best. And, you know, he was a unique guy coming out of LSU. He was part of that great team they had with Joe Burrow, and he played inside in college, but he certainly has the skill set to play outside. They're going to move him around. When you watch him on the practice field, he is just an, an elite player. He has such an understanding about how to run routes, how to get open. He's quarterback friendly. They're going to throw the ball to him a lot. Yeah. I, the sense we get is they're going to throw the ball a lot, period. Again, like if you're talking, hey, coming from L.A., coming from McVay, coming from Washington, that offense, like they were bottom 14 in pass rate last year under Mike Zimmer. And now here comes KOC and Wes Phillips and feels like they're going to they're going to go pretty pass heavy this year. Is that a fair assessment? Well, you think? it'll be interesting to see that running back's pretty darn good. It is. Yes. So, he is. so hand that guy the ball. You're going to make the quarterback better. You're going to make the receivers better. If you break the huddle and they have to defend run and pass, you're going to be a much more threatening offense. And I think that's what they're going to go for as much as anything else. If you look at the Rams, the Rams are a run team first. And they've always been a run team first. It's play action off of that. It's movement and shots off of that. So that's what they do. So I think, I think Dalvin Cook's a big part of this thing, but there's no doubt they're going to spread it around to that skill outside. I believe Kirk Cousins is one of, if not the best play action quarterback in the NFL. So if they can get that going, Absolutely. I think uh, things will go really well for them. Worth noting, I did Peter King's podcast yesterday, yeah. and he mentioned going to Vikings camp with Coach Garrett. And he just said, I'm telling you, end of your draft, K.J. Osborne. So what, he just he liked uh, K.J. Osborne. Going to throw that out. 
Um, let's talk about uh, let's talk about Chicago this year and Justin Fields, and that's an offense in transition as well. What did you see from Bears camp? Your takeaway there? Well, I love Matt Eberflus, okay. uh, and you can tell he's trying to establish the culture the right way with the right kind of guys there. They practice well, they practice the right way, but they're a young team, and uh, and they're going to have to continue to infuse that team with offensive talent. Uh, Justin Fields, I think he showed glimpses of why he was a first-round pick last year. You saw that in practice. He's athletic. He can throw it all over the place. For him, it's just a matter of getting comfortable in Luke Getz's offense. Luke comes from Green Bay, so there's going to be some elements of that to it. But again, I think so much of this goes back to balance. They have to find a way to run the ball take some pressure off the quarterback, attack the defenses different ways. And I think they'll do that as it goes. I know this, they're going to play fast, they're going to play hard, they're going to take the ball away on defense, and that's going to help their offense as the season goes on. I think the concern with Chicago has been the offensive line and whether Fields is just going to be scrambling too much. I don't think anyone doubts his talent. It's just whether his context is going to let him succeed. What did you say at camp around the offensive line and what it's going to be like for Fields? You know, I think they're young on the offensive line. I think there are holes on the offensive line. They just picked up Alex Leatherwood, who was, yeah. who was released by, by the Raiders. So it's obvious when you claim a guy like that, we have needs, we're going to pounce on a guy like that. So they're going to bring resources in as they go. There's some stuff they have to clean up with the personnel in the, in the organization. So they're going to be some growing pains. On offense, it's the offensive line. I think they need more skill. They have some guys they can go to, but they need some skill players to help Justin Fields out. But I think this thing is going to be defensive oriented and the offense is going to, is going to learn as they go. Yep. By the way, but I think that's really interesting just from a fantasy perspective because if they're playing good defense, it means Justin Fields isn't going to be down a lot you know, and having to throw a lot, which happens to a lot of young quarterbacks where they get on a team that has a bad defense and then they're, 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 they're stuck in these you know, second and long, third and long situations or they're, they're down you know, 15 in the, in the you know, second quarter and now they're having to just throw every – so if they can be a little bit more balanced, that takes pressure off of Fields. And the thing that you said that's interesting the most is that when you saw Fields, you're like, look, it's still a kid that can make every throw. We know about the athleticism and the ability with his legs. And so, right, if we can get him a little bit of time, we, we personally like Mooney and Cole Komet, their tight end, quite a bit. So, you know, I, I would not want to go into a fantasy season with Justin Fields as my starting quarterback, but there's tremendous upside there second half of the year as they, as they sort of gel as an offense. Both those guys you mentioned, Mooney and Komet, they will be the featured skill guys in that yep. offense. If that right. makes and, sense. And both guys are going way low in terms of ADP. Yep. So I mentioned Justin Jefferson as potentially the best wide receiver in the game. Bit of a disservice to Cooper Cup, who was the best receiver last season. <laughs> now with the Rams, what did you see with McVay using Allen Robinson, his new teammate? I think that's a fun pickup for them. Yeah. Uh, he's been a sneaky good player in this league for a long time, and, and now he's in an environment that I think can feature, can feature him. Cooper Cup is a fantastic player. You think about the numbers he had last year, the receptions, the touchdowns, the yards, all of that, and then he's probably the best blocking receiver in the National Football League. What they ask him to do yeah. as a blocker is off the charts, and he digs in there and does it, and, and they rave about him there. He's like the best guy. So, so that's the kind of guy that you want to pay a lot of money to. That's the yeah. kind of guy you want to make a cornerstone player on your team. But everybody else knows that too. So he's going to continue to get more and more attention to get a guy like Allen Robinson on the other side. He'll be a featured guy. He's a bigger guy, a little bit more of a possession receiver, but he's a baller. And Matthew Stafford's going to love throwing him the football all year long. Well, and Allen Robinson's <clears throat> going to love catching the ball. Yeah. We've talked about this. Like, again, never underestimate the – the importance of an upgraded quarterback for a wide receiver. Cooper Cup being the greatest example of that last year, going from Jared Goff, all due respect, to Matthew Stafford. Massive upgrade for Cooper Cup. Well, Allen Robinson now goes from Nick Foles and, you know, I mean, like, and, and Mitch Trubisky and, you know, and, you know, Andy Dalton last year and, and Justin, a rookie Justin Fields to Matthew Stafford. Matthew Stafford's the best quarterback Robinson's ever played with in his career by a large margin. And so I think that McVay, who's a player's coach, it's going to get the best out of him. As you mentioned, big body. Rams were top five in, in red zone and goal-to-go pass attempts last year. Like, they like to throw when they get in close, especially with their running backs banged up. So, I think double-digit touchdowns is absolutely within the realm of possibility for Allen Robinson. He made my love list. I think he's going way too low outside of outside of the top 20 on ADP. I think that's – give me Allen Robinson. We're, we're both in <laughs> on Allen Robinson this last year. Speaking of wide receivers – you went to Green Bay. That's a massive question. We all know about Aaron Rodgers, but the big question is, who's he throwing to? 
Tell me what you saw in Green Bay. Were there any guys that stood out to you? And any concerns that you have about the Packers offense having spent time with Aaron and the team there? You know, you mentioned receivers benefiting from great quarterbacks. Right, yeah. And, and reflect back on all the guys that Peyton Manning played with. Yeah, sure. All those guys that nobody knew about. And then all of a sudden they're playing with Peyton Manning and their household names. Right. And yeah. then they go somewhere else and nobody hears about them again. Yeah. And, and these elite quarterbacks do that for guys. And, and no more elite than Aaron Rodgers. This guy is ridiculous. And uh, – uh, he, he is such a good player. I'm talking about the quarterback. Yeah. And, and he raises everyone's level. He makes the coaches better. He makes the defense better because how they practice. He certainly makes everybody in the offense better because of his skill and the standard that he has. And I think that's going to be the case for them in Green Bay. Obviously, you lose, you know, Devontae. This is a, this is a rare receiver, one yeah, of the sure. best in the league. But uh, I'm betting on him, not against him. Dubs is a young guy who they really, really like. And uh, – Aaron Rodgers has a way of bringing out the best and guys around him, certainly the receivers. And uh, you talk about a, a, a little bit of a sneaky offense that you need to keep an eye on. To me, it's the Green Bay Packers. You know, I love to hear that. We've been saying this all along, that we, that we think people are – we get it, Adams is great, but he's still Aaron Rodgers. And if you have to take a bet, I'd rather bet on Aaron Rodgers than against him because when you bet against Aaron Rodgers, you usually <laughs> lose. Proposition. It is a losing proposition. <laughs> him and I both said from a betting perspective, I don't know. Give me the over on ten and a half wins for the for the Packers this year. They're going to be they're going to be, be a fine. better offense than people give them credit for. Yep, absolutely. gone against them a long time. I was on the losing end a number of times against <laughs> him. A couple of tough yeah. tough playoff yeah. games yeah. In, in some big games. So the respect that I have for him yeah. is off the charts. Having spent a day in their building with him, it's even higher still. This is a rare player, one of the all-time greats. Absolutely. That's well, fantastic. thank you for joining the show, Jason. Absolutely. Loved having you. Yep. Love the insight. Sam Flood, he has done his contractual <laughs> obligation. Mark that off. You are the best, Jason. It has been an absolute thrill to work with you yeah. on uh, Football Night in America, and hopefully we can get you back here yeah. on the show Absolutely. when you're in town. Absolutely. Great to fantastic. be here with you guys. All right, brother. A couple Thanks, of man. legends. Thanks, guys. We'll be back right after this. I'm being told to read this promo, which is all about how to get your Matthew Berry content. You're like, I need more, as if, as if I don't talk enough. Here are more ways to get me. First off, this show, obviously. You can watch full episodes and clips of the show on demand anytime you want on Peacock and on the new NFL on NBC YouTube channel. Obviously, this podcast is available 24-7 wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen to the show live, NBC Sports Audio on Sirius XM Radio. Follow me on Social media. I'm at Matthew Berry TMR on, on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. I'm basically at Matthew Berry TMR on all forms of social media except the Fantasy Life app where I'm merely at Matthew Berry. Go to NBCSportsEdge.com, RotorWorld.com for my rankings, my love hate column, my 100 facts, and my 10 list of 10, which is coming out later today. So please check that out. And I'm sure we'll figure out another way to, um, to, to get my content. Do you follow me on TikTok yet? <laughs> yeah. Last night, yeah. Okay. I'm on board. I'm last n- I'm last night. Yeah. We worked together two weeks. <laughs> yeah. Finally, last night, you got on board with my Pulled TikTok. Okay. Fair enough. So now. What was, what, was my favorite, what was your favorite TikTok of mine? Huh? Yeah, that's a tough question. So you just follow, you just yeah, follow, follow me. You didn't actually, actually watch, watch any of them? Yeah, yeah. There you go. But I got to follow in. It's right, the first step. That's, that's all I ask. Okay. I, say, I don't care if you watch any of my TikToks. Yeah. Just follow. That's all I want. So I just follow. So with the 10 lists of 10, Yes, sir. one of them famously is the best fantasy names. Yes, correct. So we're going to talk about a couple of them. That we, can, that we can that we can talk about. Like, well, that's I, the problem is there's so many good ones which absolutely cannot be on broadcast on television. Air. So, yeah. Oh, my so, God. Right. You killed Kenny Pickett. <laughs> Pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Little South Park there. Matt Mizzou, 58 Steel. That's yep. a good one. That is a good one. Yeah, can't go wrong with the Nothing South wrong. Park. <laughs> a lot of recurring characters as yeah, well in the so names. Yeah, so I like that. It was an interesting... Um, uh, picture for that for that uh, Twitter. Okay, <laughs> so of, that's all right. So what's CD Lamb? CD Lamb, because his name is CD, CD Lamb. Right, right. So CD had a little lamb. That's easy. Yep. Crocodile CD in Los Angeles. Which, that feels uh, like that's a bit of a stretch. Yeah. I get it. Because of, of me, but it's a, yeah, because I wrote Crocodile. I co-wrote Crocodile in Los Angeles, which is an Australian movie, which I I believe they they celebrate it. Jay told me off air that they celebrate it. <laughs> There's a yearly celebration in Australia. <laughs> yeah. Um, Crocodile CD in Los Angeles. I, that's a, that's from uh, Danny Doe two two two. A lot of uh, a lot of Cole Komet as well. Cole Komet's a good one. How Cole I Komet. how I commit your mother. All right. Yeah. Komet. I've heard that one before from last year too. Commit me, bro. 
Come at me, bro. Come at me, bro. Yeah, yeah, not bad. That was pretty good. Come at me, bro. That's yeah. um, from uh, Who Three Dat. Okay, <laughs> that one's pretty good. Well, just a lot of great names in America. We don't have these names in Australia. No. All the famous athletes are like Nathan Buckley, Chris Judd. You don't have Debo Samuel. So one of the I, names is the Home Debo, which yeah. I like. That's the, easy. Right, the yeah, Home Debo, that one's one. pretty good. Yeah. Wait, so what? give me some of the, uh, and then uh, here you go, Dry Martini to Olaves. Uh, like, you know, Dry Martini to Olives there from at Jared K. Williams. We appreciate that. Thank you very much. <sighs> give me a couple of those. Uh, 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 Fresh Prince of Hell Air, <laughs> pretty good. That one's, one's pretty like good Clyde as well. Lair, we like uh, that. Everybody loves Ramondre. Uh, everyone loves Ramondre. Yeah, I like that, that one. Song. Good yeah, kind of pace that's, and rhythm. That's a, that's a pretty good one. Uh, hey, give me one Australian name, uh, athlete name. Scott Pendlebury. Scott Pendlebury. <laughs> I want fantasy team names for Scott Pendlebury tomorrow. Listen, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. <laughs> It is closing time. We're back tomorrow on the happy hour. Thanks to Jason Garrett and Jay Croucher. I'm Matthew Berry. Peace out. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.